In this week's Kara Wrap, we'll be joined by our managing editor, Sean Kennedy, to talk about some of the top news items from Kara's space over the past week, including Sprint's recently launched unlimited data plans and AT&T's plans for 5G, as well as speak with Chris Pearson from the newly named 5G Americas on the organization's recent name change. Well, thanks for joining us on this week's Carrier App. I'm your host, Dan Meyer, Editor-in-Chief at RCR Wireless News. And joining us this week is our Managing Editor, Sean Kenny. Hey, Sean, thanks for joining us this week. We appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Dan. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, you always make the show better, so we're glad to have you on the show as well. So, uh, hey, well, first of all, let's talk about some of the big carrier news of the past week. Uh, I know last week you were pretty busy covering a lot of stuff uh, that happened. I know one of the things you mentioned uh, in the, that happened last week was uh, Sprint came out with a, a new unlimited uh, data plan, basically, getting back in the unlimited data market there. Uh, looked like uh, it was kind of a, a big target going after, I'm guessing, probably more T-Mobile than anybody else. Uh, T-Mobile, again, does offer still no, offers unlimited data, uh, kind of going after them. So I guess what was your I guess, general thoughts that we saw, what came out of Sprint uh, last week? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, unlimited data really is sort of the, uh, the thing right now. Yeah. Consumers really want it, but from a carrier perspective, it's, it's difficult to provision and to price. So that yeah. really is a unique thing, I think. Uh, you know, AT&T customers that still have it are deeply grandfathered into contracts, not really available there so much. Yeah. Verizon, same thing. So T-Mobile and Sprint, this really is a competitive kind of sell against that they can use against one another. And given the larger market dynamics, it would occur to me that Sprint and T-Mobile are each other's number one competitors. Yeah. So it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, helps Sprint capture customers, uh, I guess new customers. I don't really see how that would win customers back from T-Mobile, but regardless, it's it's something that Sprint needs to do. And uh, a big part of that is this mysterious network improvement plan. Yeah, yeah. Like really promising, stick with us. And in a couple years, this network <laughs> is fantastic. So in the meantime, how do we kind of keep customer attention? How do we keep attracting new customers to the extent possible? And, uh, you know, that's, that's all part and parcel of old uh, Marcelo's uh, whistle stop tour that's going on right now too. Yeah. yeah that's something else yeah, I know you covered as well last week was, yeah, it sounds like he's trying to get out there and be a little more of a, a face of the company, uh, trying to get out there, at least to the stores, listening to customers as he's claiming to do, uh, kind of really taking, you know, maybe a, a page from, a from a T-Mobile's uh, uh, playbook as well. But uh, yeah, it does seem like he is definitely trying to ge- be more of the of the face of the company, kind of get out there a little bit better. Uh, that was an interesting uh, uh, story that came out as well. Yeah, that, that's another great point. You know, when you think T-Mobile, you think uh, John Ledger. And so maybe Sprint has realized that that is effective from a marketing perspective. So they're really trying to intimately connect the brand with Marcelo Claret. And what they're doing right now, he's calling it a listening tour, and he's uh, blogging about it on uh, LinkedIn if you care to follow that. I think so far he's stopped in uh, Kansas City, Seattle, and L.A., and I like to envision this as him, like, riding a train around the <laughs> I don't think that's what's happening, but, you know, anyway, that's how I picture it. Hey, I mean, if, if, if Sprint's creative people were on this, they would have a nice little graphic with his little face on a train going around the country. Uh, they, I mean, they can really take advantage of this. I mean, so far they've been, at least, you know, from a public perspective, uh, pretty quiet on this. I think they really should be taking advantage of this. I mean, you know, they don't have a lot of uh, uh, positive points out there. This could be something they could really be pushing more uh, to get to at least get people uh, a little more comfortable with the Sprint name and Sprint bringing out there. I mean, Sprint just needs to be able to turn around their their current uh, public perception at this point. And if they can do anything, even if, even if it's somewhat funny, I mean, T-Mobile's been doing that for for years now. And if they could, you know, try to become a little more uh, cordial, a little more easygoing in their in their mannerisms, it might be a good a good move for them just to get. You know, people back on board with what Sprint's doing, and obviously with the train stop, whatever it's going to be, you know, kind of getting out there would be a good way to do it, I think. Yeah, they're, uh, you know, I know we, we probably talk about yeah. them a little too much, but Sprint, yeah. they're really fascinating right now. We weren't able to get it in the newsletter today, but we'll have it tomorrow. I saw that uh, SoftBank uh, spent $17 billion buying their own stock back, and uh, the sort of dynamic here is Sprint and SoftBank both reported pretty low quarterlies. Yeah. as did Alibaba, which is another major SoftBank investment. So that price went way down 
maybe too far down yeah. to really accurately reflect the market. So SoftBank used that opportunity to purchase back a big chunk of their uh, stock that had previously been issued. So uh, it seems like they really are committed to Sprint, uh, committed to turning Sprint around, yeah. Yeah. You know, not just maintaining Sprint, but actually putting more and more money into Sprint. So I, I just, as we've discussed before, I'm keenly interested to see what, uh, SoftBank's long-term appetite for Sprint is. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. No, it definitely seems like the investors out there who are very bullish on Sprint, probably those who own Sprint stock or are buying up Sprint. I mean, they're all kind of saying this that Sprint right now is definitely probably undervalued at this point. I mean, uh, you know, stocks have been going down. The market itself has been going down as well, but uh, but Sprint stock seems like it's fairly low. I mean, their value right now, their, their market cap is probably well below what their just their Spectrum holdings are, are worth. So you would think as a long-term play. Sprint being devalued as it is, and even SoftBank to an extent. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm guessing smart money is probably being invested in the Sprint at this point because, again, like you said, I mean, they, they do have some value there, even if it's just for Spectrum assets, but they still have, you know, 50 million customers. They still have a, a big network out there. There's still some money there. So, yeah, it would seem like if you've got uh, some extra cash lying around, you know, throwing a little bit at Sprint at, at, its, at its current price, it might not be a bad way to throw some money. I mean, probably better than throwing some money at uh, some NBA games or something like that. But, uh, uh, it could be a way to do it at this point. So that seems to be what uh, what SoftBank is banking on at this point is trying to get get in low on Sprint and its own stock, obviously too, and, and kind of riding that out as as the company, uh, per, uh, you know, should improve its performance. So that'll be something to see. But but again, back to the, the unlimited data thing from Sprint. I mean, again, of all the carriers out there, Sprint's always been talked about as being the one carrier that could probably most support unlimited data on its network. And obviously, that's kind of going back to 2.5 Spectrum, and that's still Spectrum that's it's trying to roll out more. So it does seem like if Sprint is able to, with this unlimited data plan, ride it for a little bit, get those 2.5 handsets into people's hands. Uh, obviously, you know the new uh, iPhone is one of those devices out there, uh, and then those customers can can maybe be on that 2.5 network most you know, predominantly. Uh, it shouldn't really impact Sprint's operations too much. They should have the spectrum there to support that. So yeah, again, they should be able to support this this effort, and obviously they're getting in at a pretty good price point as well. Uh, you know, AT&T is doing unlimited as well now with uh, kind of a, a tie into the direct TV assets. So that's a little bit different. Uh, but and then Verizon's still st staying out of the unlimited data at this point. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if Sprint can play this correctly, uh, you know, like they could be a good a good player in this unlimited data space. At least help them kind of again continue some momentum with their 50% off promotion that they've extended as well. So continue that that momentum at least in at least the consumer's mind and getting customers on board. So uh, could be interesting to watch how that plays out. Yeah, see, that's a, a great point is the, the spectrum assets that Sprint yeah. has. I mean, they are stocked up. They have that 2.5 spectrum. And uh, I forget how they brand it, maybe LTE Extreme or LTE Extended, whichever it is. LTE uh, Pro, I, I, yeah, whatever their, num their name is for right now. But, yeah. but anyway, they're, they're, they're really the only ones that are poised from a spectrum position right now to offer that uh, carrier aggregation across three bands of spectrum and yeah. push throughput to the handset in a lot of metros at the same time. So, I mean, that really is a tremendous asset from them. And you follow those spectrum auctions closely. I mean, this is, it's the real estate of, of the telecom world. Yeah. You know, it's, it's incredibly valuable and there's not really any way that it's going to get cheaper. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So for them, it's again, a good play for them. And obviously there's spectrum auction coming up, which they're not participating in, but they, again, they really don't need to at this point when it comes to at least that high density spectrum that 2.5 brings. So, but yeah, so very interesting for them. So yeah, again, it was interesting news that came out of them last week. Uh, I know, you know, we've had some columnists on our, on our website kind of talk a bit about Sprint needing to kind of push off from that 50% off promotion that they've been running for the past couple of months and try something different. I mean, obviously that's, you know, a bit of a, a drain probably on, on, on average revenue per user uh, over time, but if they can get people on unlimited data, that'll, you know, at a good price point, uh, it could be a good, a good move for them. So we'll see how that plays out going, going forward. And again, with with uh, with their CEO out there, uh, you know, putting his ear to the ground and listening to people, you know, another positive for for Sprint as well. So uh, two pretty interesting Sprint related stories. Obviously, Sprint always gets a lot of attention right now. But but another one that came out last week too, I thought was interesting was that the AT and T kind of finally coming out with their plans for five G. Uh, obviously, Verizon came out late last year uh, at the CTIA show, uh, kind of pushing the fact that hey, we're going to be uh, you know rolling out some five G trials in 2016, which is you know here we are 2016 now. Uh, which is really ahead of a lo what a lot of people thought we'd be looking at for 5G. Uh, you know, Verizon's going to be using a, a non-standard uh, technology for that at this point. Uh, but at t over the meantime, has kind of been uh, a bit quiet on the 5G front, kind of, you know, saying, hey, we don't really need this quite yet. Uh, but it seemed like finally they had to at least come out there and say something. And so they came out last week's, you know, kind of, of the roadmap really for what their 5G plans are. 
uh, you know, again, it does seem like that we're kind of, you know, getting that, that momentum going again for, for this move towards 5G. It's like another, another push from at t there. Yeah, they're actually going to try a lot right here in uh, RCR's backyard, Austin, Texas. I, I believe they're uh, at some point in the process of getting an experimental license from yeah. the FCC to, uh, to test this. And I, I think it's important to note, uh, you know, we posted this story on social media and it got a lot of interesting comments. But I, I feel the need based on that to make it abundantly clear that these aren't, you know, hello, can you hear me type tests. These are <laughs> of an air interface. Yeah. You know, there aren't any 5G phones uh, anywhere. You know, at and is not sitting on like an iPhone 9 for <laughs> 5G purposes. It's not happening. They're going to be huge fixed pieces of equipment that they're testing the link. And we've seen iterations of this before in lab settings. Uh, I'm thinking of a, a trip we took up to Plano to Erickson's office and looked at their 5G test bed. Um, Austin, interesting locale. I don't really have a ton of insight into that. We do have a robust tech community here, and we have one of the preeminent 5G research organizations located at the University of Texas, Austin here. That's the UT Wireless Networking Communication Group. They do a ton of work around millimeter wave, which is considered to be a really important part of an eventual 5G standard. So yeah. It piqued my curiosity if maybe there's some relationship there that we're not aware of that'll somehow support AT&T's endeavors. But needless to say, you know, they were a little skeptical when Verizon made their announcements. <laughs> not skeptical about the need to start 5G R&D, but maybe a little more skeptical about Verizon's timeline. Yeah. And in their answer to that, though, they've, they've put out a lot more specific information than Verizon has in terms of we need access to this band, this band, this band, we're going to do this, this, and this. So it seems like maybe they were just sort of biding their time to put that out there. And Mobile World Congress next week, not a bad idea to kind of get in on that news cycle and put 5G out there. So it'll be uh, interesting to see what they do. And I'm pleased to report that we hope to have a front row view of it here in Austin. Yeah, that's a great thing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I know in, in the past, ATT has kind of done a lot of initial trials in, in the Texas area, and obviously in Dallas, uh, Houston, uh, even in Austin as well, too. So they have kind of doubled around that area with a lot of early uh, launches, obviously in Atlanta as well, too, for themselves. But yeah, it does seem like Austin is probably a good market for them because the size of it, I mean, while it's a big market, it's not the size of Dallas. Uh, not the size of San Antonio. I mean, it's not, it's not the, uh, a too huge of a, a market that they can't somewhat control. Uh, the topography there is fairly flat, so it makes it fairly easy, at least in the, in the metro area there, to kind of put up some towers. I think they're using the 3.5 spectrum, I, I think I read, uh, for some of the trials, which doesn't have a lot of pro propagation. So, uh, you know, if they can have a fairly uh, dense area to kind of to, to trial it in, it seems like it's a smart place to do it in. And again, for you guys there, you know, you're down in Austin right there, so you guys can I'm sure be up to date on what's happening there. But you're right, it's not going to be uh, people walking around with new devices, uh, talking on the phone. It's going to be, you know, again, very network trial centric, a lot of, probably a lot of lab stuff going on, uh, so that you've seen already. So uh, it will be interesting, but again, it's, it is good timing for at t It allows them to kind of counter the Verizon push. Uh, like you said too, I mean, ahead of Mobile World Congress, uh, with them and now Verizon, or Verizon and now at t both announcing 5G plans, it kind of puts, um, excuse me, the US almost back at least among the leaders when it comes to kind of this push towards 5G. I mean, the past year or so, we've seen a lot of push from, from Asia and from Europe on, on a lot of 5G initiatives, which seem to kind of indicate that they were perhaps, you know, leading in this, in this move with 5G if that matters or not at this point. Uh, but now with Verizon and AT&T getting on board pretty aggressively with this, it does seem to put uh, the U.S. at least back on somewhat of a footing, uh, again, ahead of Mobile Congress, which is a big, you know, promotional, uh, you know, you got to be out there and at least get some, some words out there on it. So, uh, it was a good push for them to kind of get that out there too. So it's good for the, the, the U.S. market too. So it'll be interesting how that kind of plays out. Uh, uh, I'll also point out that uh, FCC Commissioner uh, Rosenworl, uh, maybe two weeks ago, whenever they had their last open meeting, she made some comments around the fact that the U.S. needs to be a leader in 5G. And I think uh, she even went so far as to say, maybe we go it alone on 5G. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know if I, I how I feel about that necessarily, but uh, – what she said is sort of in line with an interesting thing that played out in the EU where one of the uh, higher ups in the government there focused on economic development around technology reached out to Ericsson, reached out to Orange, reached out to Telefonica and suggested that maybe Europe as a nation needed a organized collective approach to 5G, which, you know, I thought was interesting because 
I, I love the collaboration that goes on around these massive standardization project projects because there's no way that one company is going <laughs> to figure all of it out and bring it to market. So Ericsson needs to work with the University of Lund. They need to work with the University of Surrey. They need to work with uh, handset makers. They need to work with carriers and all this stuff. So uh, I think that's maybe uh, counterproductive to take a sort of nationalistic point of view on development of technology standards, but we'll see how that goes. Regardless, uh, it's great to see AT&T get into the mix. Yeah, that's always a challenge of uh, the standards process on this. I and mean, I've been a very, uh, uh, a very, I, I won't say I've been kind of against this 5G movement, but uh, I just think it's going to, you know, we need to kind of take it slowly and make sure everybody's on board with this. But, uh, but it does seem like, again, we're at 2016 now. I mean, the 2020 deployment timeframe we're looking at, uh, it doesn't make sense to kind of get the ball moving a bit, at least get some research done on this. So uh, that's a big part of this. And, and again, you know, uh, you know, I, I guess one indication of this as well is uh, I recently had a chance uh, to talk with, uh, with uh, 5G Americas now, uh, with the previously known as 4G Americas, which uh, just uh, recently changed its name to 5G Americas, which again kind of indicates that, again, we are kind of making this movement. Again, you know, they're not a huge part of the ecosystem, but uh, again, it just shows that the market is moving uh, towards what's going to be 5G. And it does seem like 2016 has been uh, kind of the, the, probably the biggest push we've seen so far in this move towards 5G. And it seems like that's kind of where we're going now. And obviously, 5G Americas is a, is a U.S. Uh, or a Western Hemisphere specific. Uh, trade organization, but they've done a lot of work, work really closely with the former GSM community, which AT&T has been part of. And so obviously with AT&T coming out with their 5G announcement last week, uh, it seemed the timing was right for them to make their move to, to 5G Americas now. Uh, T-Mobile's been talking about 5G as well too. So, uh, you know, this organization's movement there just kind of indicates that again, this, this movement is happening. Um, I guess I should probably at some point stop being such a, a naysayer to this and just get on board with this and kind of be, be ready for it at this point. Uh, it goes against my tendencies a bit, but uh, yeah, it does look like we're kind of moving in that direction. So uh, it's interesting to see where we're, we're moving there. But uh, but hey, on the topic of uh, 5G Americas, I did have a chance, like I said, to talk with uh, Chris Pearson there, who is the uh, president of 4G Americas, now 5G Americas, to get some insight from him on the topic, on, on their name change and kind of what this means for the industry. So uh, so we'll take a look at that interview here in a second. But again, I want to thank you, uh, Sean, again, for joining us on the, uh, the show this week. Thanks so much for the great insight, and uh, hopefully you can join us again soon on this. All right. Thanks, Dan. All right. Sounds good. And let's go look at that interview now. Well, thanks for joining us this week. This week, we are joined by Chris Pearson, who's the president of the newly named 5G Americas. Hey, uh, Chris, thanks for joining us again. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it as well. Great. Well, again, let's maybe start off with uh, uh, the name change. So uh, 4G Americas, I was just getting used to the name 4G Americas after <laughs> uh, 10 years or whatever it was, and now we're at 5G Americas. So maybe start off with, uh, I guess, the, the name change for you guys. What was the importance of it, uh, maybe the timing of it, uh, and what it means for, for the organization there? Yeah, it was extremely important day for us to, you know, evolve to 5G Americas. I know lots of uh, press and analysts and uh, <laughs> others in the industry have been asking for it for a long time. But really, the timing was right uh, last week to move to the 5G Americas brand name. It, you know, we've been working as an organization on 5G for over two years, mm -hmm. and so it reflects a lot of the work that we've been doing, and also uh, coincides, you know, with our vision of where 5G is going. I must say, though, it's it, you know, for us, it's really important for the world to know how important that we think LTE, LTE Advanced, and then LTE Advanced Pro is today and will be in the future. And if you look at the statistics, uh, it's pretty amazing uh, how, how far LTE has come already, but yet how far it's going to go as well. Yeah. And that's kind of the great thing about LTE, it seems like. I mean, there's, there's all these releases that have already been part of LTE, I mean, at least 9, 10, 11, 12, but there's still like 13, 14 other ones being, being worked on, being finalized, that really kind of show that, that, that the LTE bones that are being laid in, the, in these networks are really going to be built upon. I mean, it seems like that, you know, operators who have developed and uh, have spent money on LTE deployments, they're not going to all of a sudden have to rip out all this technology, like a 3G to 4G kind of thing. They can they actually keep this stuff going and, and use that as a basis for what, what's going to be their 5G networks. Absolutely. Uh, really, if you look at LTE, it's going to be the mobile broadband foundation for 5G uh, for years and years and years to come. Yeah. And if you look at the technological roadmap of innovation, that's happening through the standards process at 3GPP, and then finally getting into commercial deployments, you'll see that that's an incredibly robust innovation roadmap. So uh, the, you know, the, the future is extremely bright for LTE, even though you know, the buzz in the industry uh, is uh, you know, talk about 5G, and I'm sure at, when you go to Mobile World Congress next week, you know, the buzz will be about 5G, and there'll be a lot of demos on 5G. 
Uh, but we're hoping to see also a lot of demos on LTE Advanced and LTE Advanced uh, Pro because there are some great technical features that are coming out, and it's really good for the connected society to have them. Yeah, yeah that's a good point, too. Because I mean, I, I do hope that, that the operators out there and the vendors out there, uh, I mean, I hope they don't just drop the LTE name because, I, again, I think it's, I think the, the consumers are finally are realizing what LTE is and, and, and to kind of get rid of what's built up a pretty good brand name and, and recognition over the past, you know, six years now that it's, that's been out there, uh, it seemed like it'd just be a false thing to do. I mean, it would be really good. I, I hope that they, they continue to, to kind of leverage that and, you know, that we don't see LTE disappear from the phone screens and things like that. I mean, I hope people recognize that LTE does mean higher speeds and, and, and that, the, you know, that this is definitely the future for, for 5G and that we don't lose all that work that's been put out there for this brand over the past, you know, like you said, several years. Yeah, I think the, the, the future for LTE is very bullish, and I, I think that you actually will see uh, the LTE brand name and, and, you know, the evolutions of it, LTE Advance and LTE Advance Pro, uh, continue. So uh, it is such an, an important technology for the entire mobile broadband wireless ecosystem and even, even the narrowband uh, yeah. ecosystem for IoT and things like that. So I think it's extremely important, and I, I think you'll continue to see uh, LTE even in the brand uh, names. Um, of technology, uh, but definitely from the, the standards roadmap and the great commercial products and services that are going to come out, LTE is going to be around for a long, long, long time. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So now it seems like too, uh, the timing of this was pretty important as well because I know, again, for for you guys, you know, I, we've talked a lot in the past, and you guys were really. Uh, I don't want to say conservative when it comes to the move to five G, but you guys were probably one of the more pragmatic organizations out there when it came to hey. There's no need to jump the gun on this. It's, you know, wait till we're kind of ready for this. Uh, but it does seem like you're right. It does seem like the timing of it. I mean, obviously, late last year, Verizon announced their, their 5G move. Uh, like you said, last week, AT&T announced their 5G move. It did seem like that the, kind of the momentum is really starting to, to move in this, this move towards 5G. And obviously, you know, we're still probably four years away from true commercial deployments on this. Uh, but again, it takes a long time to work with the standards bodies and the processes and, you know, all the trials and things like that. So it does seem like the timing of this, you know, I've been kind of maybe one of the the bigger naysayers when it comes to, hey, we don't need to do this as well. But uh, I think for myself, even it's almost time to kind of come on board and say, look, it's probably time to really start pushing this. And it does seem like for you guys, the timing just did seem to be right for this at this point. Yeah, the timing definitely was right. Um, like I said, we've been doing work for over two years yeah. on it. Uh, but we're also one of the um, pragmatic and, and realists in it. When we look at uh, 5G technology, the com standardized commercial deployments, we expect them to be 2020 yeah. and beyond. Yeah. So if you look at uh, kind of going out to 2021 even, you'll see that LTE at that time will have 75% of the world's population covered. And again, providing that mobile broadband foundation for 5G. As far as the, you know, the, back to the timing, mm -hmm. uh, it was important for us to, you know, since we have been doing so much work on 5G, uh, even though we're a supporter of LTE, to actually change our name to kind of reflect on, on that work. And also the fact that we are a futuristic, yeah. uh, you know, visionary organization. There was a lot that's happened, though, in, in, you know, recently uh, with the decisions at, at WARC 15, um, the, the fact that the 3GPP standards process is, has begun or just started, um, the fact that 3GPP put out some uh, deadlines or due dates uh, for goals for the standard, which would be you know, the first phase at the second half of 2018, mm -hmm. and the second phase of 5G um, would be December of 2019 in mm -hmm. time for you know, the I, ITU process. So um, there's been quite a few developments over the last few months that have coincided with you know, our kind of final decision to move forward with the 5G America's name. So it, it kind of all fell into place. And I think it was a great decision by our Board of Governors to move forward. Yeah, and it seems like to the, again, on the timing aspect of it, again, going into the Mobile World Congress next week, it does kind of show that the Western Hemisphere is kind of on board when it comes to 5G, because it does seem like over the past year, year and a half, that, that Europe and Asia have really been uh, making a lot of noise, you know, good and bad, but uh, really talking up the 5G, a move towards 5G, a lot of collaboration going on, a lot of announcements coming up from, from those areas. And there was perhaps a bit of a concern that, you know, maybe the, the Western Hemisphere of the U.S., North America was kind of losing uh, its position as, as a leadership in, in kind of this move towards uh, mobile broadband services. You know, when it came to the initial 4G LT rollouts, you know, it, obviously I think the U.S. Uh, and, and North America and even Latin America was, was at the forefront of this. Uh, and it did seem like that when it came to 5G that these other regions were kind of trying to get ahead of it. How important was it for you guys to kind of also just, you know, make sure that everybody was aware that, hey, uh, you know, we're, Western Minister, we're, we're on board with this 5G thing too and we're going to be ahead of this and going to the Mobile World Congress. It seems like that's kind of an important 
you know, at least to get your foot out there and say, hey, this, this is where we're kind of, we're kind of looking at. Yeah, it, it, it had some importance. I mean, I think, number one, I think it is important for the Americas to be represented. Um, and we look at ourselves as the voice of, you know, LTE, uh, excuse me, the voice of uh, 5G yeah. and LTE for the Americas. So it's very important, um, you know, for us. Uh, but we've already been recognized by quite a few organizations around the world. You know, we have MOUs and kind of li and, and liaison statements uh, with many organizations around the world. But yeah, um, there's no doubt that if you look at the United States, uh, we've been a leader when it comes to LTE, a leader in mobile broadband, a leader in smartphones. And there's a lot of uh, regions around the world that look at that and I think say to themselves, they want to be the leaders when it comes to 5G. And so people have kind of questioned, you know, the, the, the U.S. and our region on whether we're going to be able to compete or in 5G. And I think so the timing is what turned out to be good. Again, I don't want to say that, that was the reason for it, you know, why we're doing it, but we definitely feel that um, you know, we're the voice of 5G and LTE for the Americas. We also feel that the timing is right because of all the different things that are happening in the industry now. Yeah, that's a good point too. And it does seem like too that, uh, that like you said, I mean, I mean, 5G is going to be such a broad-based uh, technology, more so probably than even 4G was. I mean, we look at, you know, Internet of Things and uh, yep. connected cars and devices, but it does seem like that this next evolution is going to be such a big, broad thing that, you know, it's somehow hard to imagine that that mobile broadband can, can get bigger than it already is, but it seems this next evolution is going to see it just really, you know, I mean, I know we kind of referenced the Ericsson 50 billion connected devices things in the past, but... Yep. I mean, while it seemed crazy at the time, and maybe still seems a little crazy, you know, if you look at the projected market out there, I mean, it's not, it's not too crazy. I mean, it's <laughs> out there, but uh, yeah. I can see it being possible, you know? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, if you look at the, uh, you know, what 5G wants to do yeah. uh, as far as its goals, I mean, it's really about providing a diverse set of uh, applications and services to meet various use cases. And, that, and I would say, even to today, um, you know, you know, 5G Americas has put out some uh, use cases yeah. and services and applications for five for 5G. NG Amana has done the same. I, and but I think that this is we're at the tip of the iceberg because as other industries look at you know the, the possibilities of what's going to be there as far as the technology side, then they'll start thinking about the possibilities of how it could be uh, interwoven woven with their your their vertical industry strategies or whatever the, the business enterprise might be strategy. So I think we're at the tip of the iceberg of what could happen for 5G. Um, but I also feel that you know, LTE and LTE Advance will meet many of those use cases in the coming years. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it does seem like, yeah, from what we're seeing so far out there, you're obviously, yeah, LTE is going to be a big part of this going forward. So, and I'm guessing too that you've already got your new business cards all set up and I'm sure you've got, now you can get rid of all the 4G America's ones and I'm hoping you still have some 3G America ones out there too. Those are classic. <laughs> yeah, this new poster. Uh, the poster looks great. So uh, you know, it, 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 you know we're, 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 we're moving along as quick as we can, but uh, there was a, there's a lot of work to be done, obviously, but we'll be ready next week for Mobile World Congress, the business cards, of course. I'm sure you will. I'm sure that'll be a big part of this. But, but I think I want to touch on a bit too with you, and you mentioned a little bit earlier, was obviously there was the Work 15 event that happened late last year, and there was a lot of talk there about, you know, different spectrum that was going to be needed for 5G. And uh, still, I mean, again, we're really early in the process, and I know a lot of work's happened since then about getting kind of the processes moving, on, at least aligning some spectrum bands, or at least looking at what needs to be used for spectrum. I guess looking back at that event, what was your view of kind of what happened there and, and maybe the importance of, of what came out of that event leading towards, you know, kind of the continued evolution of, of what we need in terms of spectrum and need for, for the move towards 5G? Yeah, well, I think there was progress at ITU, I mean, Work 15, yeah. um, and, and the big progress would be really associated with the fact that they identified 11 bands to be studied for Work 19. Yep. Uh, that would be considered high high spectrum bands for 5G. So that was progress. I do think um, you know there are challenges when you look at uh, ITE you and trying to come together with you know global harmonized spectrum because it just there's just you know lots of incumbents out there. There's lots of regional viewpoints. There's a lot of country viewpoints and so forth. So um, it's it's a very uh, I think uh, positive to have you know work. Uh, 15, but it's also a big challenge to, to actually move forward. But I do, I do think it's it's great that there was 11 bands uh, put put aside to be studied. I mean, I, I also believe that we need to have more uh, lower band spectrum because 
you know, it's not just going to be about um, you know millimeter and centimeter waves. It's going to be you know, in high band spectrum. Yeah. It's going to be about you know the lower bands that are going to serve these applications and services as well for 5G. So there's a lot of work that still remains to be done. I mean, I think the U.S. Um, having their recent uh, NPRM uh, notice of proposed rulemaking uh, to try to get um, some input. Uh, and feedback from the industry about their rules for high band spectrum. I think that's a great step in the right direction. So there are a lot of these uh, kind of regulatory, um, you know, actions that are taking place that I think are positive. But, you know, ITU was, did have some progress. Um, I think the industry probably would even want more progress because of what we see as the, uh, the mobile broadband demand curve. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Again, lining up, you know, the international uh, community behind select bands is like you said, I mean, it's becoming more and more difficult. There just aren't that much, you know, people are, are using the spectrum a lot of, a lot of cases. And so, yeah, the mm-hmm. incumbent issue is going to be huge and, and aligning it. And that's always kind of been like the, the ongoing goal is, you know, as, as we progress in, in this, in this mobile telecom world, it's, you know, trying to align more and more internationally with spectrum, just make it easier for everybody. And it's, it's always such a huge challenge. And, and, and like you said, it's not getting any easier. I mean, it just seems like, you know, the more spectrum you're trying to pull it, pull together, uh, that just becomes more of an issue is just trying to make sure that, hey, it works in this country, it doesn't work in this country, what can we do to, to align that if we can, at least maybe even parts of it. Uh, but that does seem like that's going to be probably the biggest challenge for the ITU over the next four years before, between now and that next, next work event is going to be, you know, can we nail some down? And if we can't, well, you know, can we at least, you know, do the best we can at this point? And that's, that seems like that's going to be a lot of work for you guys just trying to work with these guys and make sure we can kind of at least make some harmonization issues there if we can. Yeah, you know, yeah, I think in a, I agree totally. I mean, um, there's a lot of work to be done, and even those 11 bands, I mean, to uh, to study them and get them, uh, you know, in front of work 19 with some recommendations is is, a, is you know, it's a great opportunity, but a lot of work that needs. But but I think a good example of what you just talked about uh, with the challenges is the 28 gigahertz uh, band. You know, there was a lot of expectation that that would be one of the bands to be studied um, uh, at you know at work 15 a decision to study it for work 19 and uh it didn't make it didn't make it yeah um but yet you know in the nprm recently you saw association like ours 5g america's filed that uh you know the us fcc should really uh, go you know look at uh 28 gigahertz and and move forward on it because i we, you know we believe that it's a it's a good band and in fact what's really interesting about it it already has um uh a mobile focus mm-hmm. around the world on the 28 gigahertz. So even though it wasn't listed as one of the 11, you know there is um, some precedent precedent uh, for it to be a a mobile ad, a mobile allocation. Yeah, it did seem like, and again, you know, reading some different commentary coming from the event, there was perhaps some political issues going on as well. Which you know, again, that's a whole different behind the scenes thing. <laughs> yeah. with those bands, but you're right. It did seem like seem like some of those bands, like again, the 20 gigahertz band is is a great band. I, mean, I was I, I was surprised with you that that didn't get maybe a little more recognition. Uh, yeah. That's like, you know, for myself looking at it, I thought hey, that's kind of a strange, like what happened there behind the scenes. Uh, yeah. so four years between now and the next event, maybe it might be brought up again and maybe there might be some, might be more work done on that if, if industry gets behind it. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. It, it was interesting to see how that plays out. And again, the FCC has done a pretty good job. I mean, the current commissioners there, they're, they're working at, you know, getting as much spectrum as they can out. Yep. A band auction coming up, the 3.5 uh, spectrum being used, uh, yeah. different trials and stuff too. So it does seem like at least here in the U.S. and I'm sure across the rest of the Americas too, uh, some pretty good work being done from a regulatory point of view and getting more spectrum uh, out there, at least, you know, for at least trialing. Because I think these governments know the importance of, of this move towards, towards 5G and keeping the spectrum uh, flow going for these, for these industries. Yeah, and I think, you know, our industry needs more, you know, all kinds of spectrum to be brought to market. I mean, obviously, we feel that exclusive use, um, you know, low band spectrum would be, you know, the best to get out to the marketplace right now. But, you know, we also understand that it's you know, there's the mid-band spectrum, the shared spectrum, and the unlicensed spectrum, all areas that uh, we all we, we need to look at and, and start to u- utilize better for the future. In Latin America, you mentioned the Americas region, I think, in the last statement that you made. Yeah. And it, it's true down there. Now, they're not really, you know, there's a lot of governments and the industry asking about 5G right yeah. now. But what they're really focused on in Latin America is getting more spectrum out to the marketplace for LTE and LTE advance because they they really want to make sure that they connect society for the social and economic development in the region and getting more spectrum out to the marketplace in Latin America is is really a critical item for um, for the governments and, and for 5G Americas that's out there encouraging them to bring out more spectrum. 
Yeah, it does seem like you're right. For a lot of those regions, that low band spectrum is going to be key for, for just expanding the, the reach of broadband. Because again, a lot of these countries, you know, have dense population areas, but they also have a lot of uh, underserved areas out in more yep. rural areas. I mean, you know, even Canada and Mexico and even the U.S. I mean, there's so many areas that just, you know, you need that low band spectrum to make it cost effective uh, for these countries to be able to roll out services to, to provide, provide even the basics of support there. And so, yeah, that seems like that's still... You know, we can't forget about that part of it because that is still nope. a very important part of this whole. whole this very important, yeah. extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Wait, well, hey, Chris. Obviously, again, uh, great to talk with you. Uh, good to see the uh, the name change finally there. I know we've been talking about it for years, but uh, 5G America. So it'll probably take me a year to get used to saying that. So I apologize now for saying 4G America all the time. But but again, I know you guys are going to be busy uh, making sure people are aware of the name change. And at the event next week, I'm sure it'll be very busy there. I yeah. get the name out there too. But uh, it's always great to catch up with you. And thanks again for the for the time today. We we appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you very much and have a great show next week too. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. And again, thanks everyone for watching the show and make sure to check us out again next week.